On ESPN's vaccine mandate, Sage Steele said that mandates are sick and scary and wasn't surprised, quote, it got to this point with Disney, a global company. That seems to be why it is that Sage Steele was suspended, even though ESPN doesn't really have suspensions that they do anymore in the new age, allegedly, but this gets a suspension. And it wasn't what she said about Barack Obama, where she told Jay Cutler it was fascinating that Obama indicated he was black on his census form, considering, quote, his black dad was nowhere to be found. Now, Jamel, I had some trepidation about calling you on this because I don't want to turn this into uh, go get Jamel every time a black person says something at ESPN or every time there's a racial discussion, but you're not afraid of this stuff. And I imagine you find it interesting because your experience with ESPN was soaked in some of this stuff as well. So I'm just interested starting off, and thank you for joining us, your perspective on what's happening here with Sage Steele. Um, first of all, Dan, I don't mind when you call me for this because at some point I'm going to call you. It's going to be an issue that faces the commu Cuban community. I'm going to be like, ask a Cuban, who do I know? Dan Levitard. So one of these days I'll get you to um, sort of pay it forward. But uh, no, in all seriousness, um, you know, what was interesting is that I went back and I looked at the statement that ESPN put out when those Trump tweets came to life versus the statement they just put out with Sage. And let's just say there was a little bit of difference. I was like, wow, I noticed very different tone, um, certainly in the way that they handled it as well. When I heard about her comments about the vaccine mandate, I thought that honestly that that was going to be the comments that got her in trouble. Now, as disrespectful and um you know, I'm not sure what the other word I would use to describe what she said about President Obama, then what she later said about uh, women and how they dress and appear well, as distasteful. Maybe that's the word I'm looking for, as those comments were. From a company standpoint, the one that was going to get in trouble was what she said about the vaccine, because that's a direct criticism of Disney slash ESPN policy. And we know they don't tend to handle that very well. And they're, they have a very low tolerance of that. What's really interesting to me about all of this is that Sage has been saying things along um, along the political lines for a long time. And I know there's this idea that ESPN is just so liberal and they've handed their company over to politically correct people. And uh, certainly we heard a lot of that when we were there as talent. But the truth of the matter is, is that at its core, it's a conservative place and they care about what conservatives think. Uh, think and they care about conservative backlash. And so all of her comments that she had made thus far, because it was quite the week, because actually it started with her comparing the um, uh, the children that had been, um, uh, the, the children that were either infected by coronavirus or had been killed by the virus to the children in Chicago. Because, you know, that's the thing to do. What about Chicago? So <laughs> it was that. It was her before that. Uh, hyping up Larry Elder, a conservative candidate that was running for governor here in California. So all along these lines, she's left all these breadcrumbs before and the company has done nothing. But again, they have told the rest of they have told everyone else that they have an issue with their talent once they start stepping into political waters. And it seemed like for some reason they decided to either ignore some of the things that she said or some or for some reason she was given a little bit of grace in this area and i think it had a lot to do with they were very aware of the criticism um that they were a little liberal company and they were trying to prove to the right wing and the conservative circles that they were not well let's attack these one at a time because it was quite a week so one of the things she said about female journalists was quote when you dress like that i'm not saying you deserve the gross comments but you know what you're doing when you're putting that outfit on end quote so let's start there before we get to the statement and some of the other stuff well i can say that i have personally overheard her say things that other female on t on air talent at espn criticize the things that they have worn and let me tell you her I sage's idea of of what is inappropriate would be a lot different than everybody else's and i think on top of what this suggests that um you know, women have a hand in their own harassment because despite the fact that she said, I'm not saying that. Well, anytime you start a sentence with, I'm not saying that, the next thing that comes out of your <laughs> mouth is exactly what you're trying to allegedly not say. And 
knowing where her line is based off the things I've heard her say about other female on air talent at ESPN, that line is very conservative. I'm like, does she want them to come out in a sack? I mean, like, what's going on here? So, um, and I just thought that was just a really poor example to provide for other female journalists. The idea that she would tell another younger journalist, I don't want to deal with you because I don't like what you represent. It's like, I don't know how that is helpful at all. So if I'm a young woman in this business, I wouldn't ask Sage Steele anything about, um, you know, come to her for any advice after hearing these things come about out of her mouth. It's just really disappointing because Sage has always positioned herself as somebody who champions women. And, um, you know, she has played a very big role since its inception in the ESPNW Summit. So to hear that, uh, from her, it was, um, yeah, I mean, it was it was disappointing. It was hurtful. Uh, I know a lot of women in the industry probably looked at that and were really taken aback And um, because they hear that enough. And even though in the news, we have heard countless stories of female journalists talk about how they were harassed, print journalists, on-air journalists, about how they were harassed by, um, you know, men in their workplace. It's, she's giving those men license to do that and saying, and other men who feel like it's not a big deal, she's giving, she's carrying their water. And it's unfortunate, but it happens. But sometimes um, women are just as bad at carrying the par- uh, patriarchy as men are, if not worse in some in, in, in some cases. Let me go ahead and read the two statements side by side. You said on Twitter that President Trump was a white supremacist. The ESPN statement on Jamel Hill, quote, the comments on Twitter from Jamel Hill regarding the president do not represent the position of ESPN. We have addressed this with Jamel, and she recognizes her actions were inappropriate. The statement on Sage Steele is, at ESPN, we embrace different points of view. Dialogue and discussion makes this place great. That said, we expect that those points of view be expressed respectfully in a manner consistent with our values and in line with our internal policies. We are having direct conversations with Sage, and those conversations will remain private. What are the differences you see there? Um, no, <laughs> number one, I guess I should have said what I said about Donald Trump more respectfully, because then maybe they would have welcomed my viewpoint. Um, and... Interesting that they also noted that their conversations with Sage remain private. And they had no, you know, compunction about letting people know that we have reprimanded her. And by the way, uh, Jamel did not consider those comments inappropriate, by the way. <laughs> so I don't know what I don't know what to say about that part of the statement. So it just, as you notice, that they were a lot more heavy-handed and harsh. And, and look, I don't I don't like to get into the whole comparison game just because people then start to think that you're bitter about it or um, that it, it's um, that it holds a lot more importance in your life than um, uh, than people would like to think. So it's not one of those things. But it's that sometimes when these things happen, you're like, wow, mm, where was all that grace when I was there? And so, uh, again, as I said, like, I, I do think. Um, and I'm happy to be proven wrong, but I do think that what's consistent about uh, ESPN's policy and how they handle these things is that they're woefully inconsistent. And it does feel like a lot of times um, that they're trying to prove, um, disprove a, a false narrative and at the same time capitulate to a certain crowd to prove that, yes, right wingers, ESPN is available for you too. Can it just be, Jamal, that they're ill-equipped for this, that this, this isn't the place where they're going to have consistent policies because the whole world has changed and it's changed around them very quickly. And how can they be consistent when that's, this is not, they don't have a lot of precedent on being able to handle any of this stuff. No, I mean, the discipline, whether it be about something you said, something you did, it's it's always the entire time I was there. And I, I know it was that way when you were there as well, is that it was always inconsistent. And I know each situation is different. And so they're judging about the situation sometimes. And you can't have with certain things a cookie cutter way of handling it all, especially when it comes to speech. And, you know, I wouldn't say this this applies to ESPN in particular, but I would say for all of media this idea that the people that deliver the news to you, um, the people that you come to for commentary at media outlets, the idea that they don't have any political opinions is a farce. And they're trying to fool the public into thinking, you know, when Don Lemon delivers you this, he has no political opinions himself or that he's playing a straight lace or objective. 
and objectivity, um, they're dying on the heel of objectivity and objectivity doesn't exist anymore. Uh, and we have to understand too, there's a big difference between objectivity and fairness. I think fairness is required in journalism. Objectivity is not because objectivity means that you're trying to both sides every issue. And sometimes that other side, all you're doing is giving um, credence and a platform to ignorance. Like if we're talking about racism, why is there two sides? There shouldn't be two sides, okay? But yet constantly the framing of racial issues in the media is using um, the two sides narrative um, under the guise of objectivity. And I think in our business period, we need to let objectivity go with certain issues. What did you do with the Obama appraisal on the Jay Cutler podcast? Because I want to talk to you about the macro, but I don't, I, I'm legitimately confused at how she continually arrives at positions that infuriate black people because she gets waved around as a hero uh, because she's espousing some viewpoints that uh, either, they, they either feel anti-black or worse. They, well, I mean, they don't feel it. They are, <laughs> you know, and so because you sometimes when um, people take a stand or they have an opinion about certain things, very fascinating to see who lines up behind them. You know, it, the same could be said for uh, the NBA players who, you know, are against the vaccine. Look at who lined up behind them. They got Ted Cruz. Enough said. So um, we say just the same thing. I don't think that people uh, and I don't want to speak for all the black community, but at least in conversations and group chats that I've had about this, because my group chat has been exploding since this happened, or group chats. It's not that she wanted to play, um, to pay, um, not tribute is not the right word, but she wanted to recognize the fact that she's Black and white. I don't think anybody cares about that. Usually, though, what happens when you're dealing with, um, you know, this very complicated to topic of, of mixed race that that it's the anti-blackness of it is what seeps out, is that clinging to one side and denigrating another. Because notice that she dropped in there that, you know, it was fascinating that Obama would identify as black, you know, because your father left you. Like, so she's not only taking a shot at black people, she's then taking a shot at black men at, at all in one punch. And that's what set everybody off. Like, had she just simply said, like, I have two parents, one is white, one is black, and I feel indebted to them both. I feel like I need to represent both of them. Nobody says a word. We've heard other mixed race people, other biracial people have said this a lot, but it is a consistent denial of one side and denigrating one side that will set the black community off. Because look, we've already in historically in, um, you know, even obviously even today, we're already constantly fed messages about why we're not enough, about um, you know how we're inferior, and this is one of those things that really pricks a nerve because you know essentially to what a lot of people got from that is that she just isn't comfortable embracing the fact that she's black because I mean let's be honest when people look at Sage Steele they don't see a white woman they see a black woman, and I think that's upsetting for a lot of us that this would be a part of her heritage that she wouldn't necessarily be proud to represent. For those listening right now who might hear in anything she says or I say a bitterness or can be filed under what you might construe as a bitterness toward ESPN, you should know that this has worked out for me and Jamel. And in many mm -hmm. instances, it's been a it's been a good career move for both of us to leave ESPN and have that freedom. And I, I think I can speak for you when I say you have great gratitude, as I do, for the things ESPN did for us. But as a business decision, Jamel, a business decision, when their focus groups show, hey, we are alienating the customer with these people who have viewpoints that are um, not objective or fair. They're political, they're racial, they're socioeconomic, they're, everything gets filed under politics now. What do you think of it as a business decision? I don't think it was ever proven that that was the case. And I realize, like a lot of people, that ESPN has lost a lot of subscribers. It's not just a reality that ESPN faces. A lot of networks, cable networks, are facing this very same 
uh, scenario. And I haven't looked at any update to see if, if, if that's still the case, but I know it was clearly a dominant storyline, you know, when we were there and then um, uh, after that as well. But that's just about changing viewing habits because a lot of times you ask people this and they're like, oh, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to um, watch ESPN because it's too political. Well, when a game they like comes on, what do they do? They watch ESPN. So I don't, I think that hearing people talk about what they, what they don't want to watch, what they don't do, I'd like to know if it's actually showing up in the data and how can that be proven considering the fact that we have so much television that we can watch so many different outlets and part of what fueled ESPN's rise to power, besides being a cultural phenomenon, is the fact that viewers did not have as many choices that they have now. And they have to compete for people's attention in a different way. Not to mention, Zillennials are watching everything from their phone, right? And uh, not just Zillennials, I mean, a lot of us are, but especially that group. And younger people, it's been shown in these said focus groups. They are not attracted to sports in the same way that my generation and your generation were. They don't want to sit down for three and a half hours and watch a football game. So it's it's a much different um, viewing experience for younger people. And rather than look at not just the science of it, but rather than provide the full context, the most the lowest hanging fruit is to say people aren't watching ESPN because it's too political. Though I don't know how they could say that now because what what is political on ESPN? There's literally nothing. All the political drama you may hear about may come from social media. And I don't know if that's the best gauge to say that ESPN's business model is being undetermined. Even for the people who had um, critical things to say about some of the things that Sage has said in the last week, are they going to stop watching SportsCenter because of Sage deal? I don't think so. You've said before here when we've talked uh, that ESPN is interested in black faces, not black voices. And when I read the reports that a content company with hundreds of hours of programming doesn't have room for the voice and the viewpoint of Bomani Jones, I found that kind of amazing, Jamel. Like it's, I'm, I'm kind of amazed at the number of hits after everything that's happened in America over the last 18 months. It doesn't cost Disney much of anything to just... <laughs> To just try to keep someone like that for optics, if for nothing else, because he's such a, just like you, such a strong voice uh, of advocacy on behalf of people. And unlike you and I, doesn't make headlines that are negative. Yeah, he's able to talk about, you know, race and um, uh, the convergence of race, sports, culture in a way that's, you know, sharp and focused and smart. And there should always be room for somebody with such a dynamic voice that Bomani has. But looking at it this way, I, I guess uh, knowing, and you, you worked alongside him, and so you know better than <clears throat> me in this regard, <clears throat> I just don't see how creatively somebody, at Boma, somebody of Bomani's ability and talent could be happy at ESPN. I just don't think it's really possible because given the direction that they want to go, and how they have deprioritized voices like his, how could he possibly be happy there? And the ESPN wanted to dive deeper into those waters. I think for a moment, you know, last year, like a lot of places, when we were discussing George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Arbery, the state of racism in this country, a lot of athletes and sports in general driving this conversation, it was very fashionable to talk about it all the time then. But as I suspected, once it was no longer at the forefront of the public mindset or once died down, that they were going to move on. And that's not to say that that's all Bo can talk about. He can talk about a breadth of things, but it is to say that there is, um, it's difficult if you're somebody like him to survive given the direction that they're going right now, because I don't think that they have the appetite or the stomach to probably talk about some of the things that he would like to discuss, discuss or to build creatively around him in a way that it would, I, all the great things that he brings to the table. I don't see him being a fit for where they are now, We're, much like you weren't anymore. We've only got a couple of minutes left here. So should a corporation stand for something? I, I would like to think so. Um, I think they should. I, I put it this way. I think they should 
if they say they do. OK, because there's a lot of corporations who never give you the illusion they stand for anything but making money. Never do that. And even though, yeah, I'd like to, at the end of the day, feel like there is some level of corporate responsibility. If you don't give me that, um, if you don't give me that hint that you do want to stay for something and you just stand for making money, I'm good with that because you're going to stay consistent. ESPN, other hand, and by extension, Disney, they would like to play both sides of it, right? They like to air documentaries about, um, you know, black athletes who have spoken up and provide programming about social justice and have, um, you know, sub sites like The Undefeated that's supposed to talk about culture and race and sports. They want to they want the audience of that, but they don't want the smoke. And it's like if you're going to delve into talking about racism and white supremacy and inequality and all these other things from a sports perspective, then you got to be here for the smoke. And and then, which is why so many companies and corporations can't really do it in an authentic and genuine way. And that means supporting your people when the fire starts and not just selectively supporting based off how you think this is going to play out in the media. So my issue with ESPN is the hypocrisy and the double mindedness. My issue is not that they deserve to be held to some standards that other corporations aren't. You either are in the game or you're not in the game. And they just like to be like, oh, sometimes we're in. We're in when it's convenient for us, but we're out as soon as all that smoke starts. And I don't think, I think because they're constantly operating in that space of trying to please everybody and pleasing no one, then they're going to run into situations like this commonly. Always illuminating. Always a pleasure. Thank you, Jamel, for making the time for us. Always. I appreciate it. Thanks, guys.